Thanks very much for inviting me back. It's a few years since I came here last and gave some personal reflections on my time um, uh, as, a, as a senior leader, particularly as a superintendent, going back some time. And this is a really big opportunity for me to get people who are under huge pressure uh, in, in the jobs that they are doing at the moment, we know that, um, in a room to learn from and from hear from. And we're going to do some interactive um, work on the app that you've got, which is also causing me quite a bit of stress and anxiety at the moment because I'm hoping it's going to work, uh, to get some of your views. So I would ask you to be honest about that because um, the title of my presentation um, today, I chose it carefully because I think there's a, there's a book out there called Emotional Survival. I don't know if anybody has seen that book. It's quite popular in the police service. It's an American book. Um, and a lot of my people in the front line particularly like this book. And I, I don't like it, I have to say. I don't like the title of it. I don't like the word emotional survival as a theme because it suggests that we're here to survive, not thrive. And if, we've, if we are not thriving in police work and in the work that we're doing, then it's a leadership issue because meaning and purpose is vital to our well-being. And what I find with uh, that particular genre uh, of book, it starts off from quite a ne negative perspective. Uh, and I can understand why people um, are interested in it. I can understand why they are, um, find, it, find it popular. But that in itself begs a question to me of why, why they do and the mindset. So I'm going to talk about some of the headline issues um, that are particularly we've picked up through all the surveys, the research, two, year, two or three years on now after raising the issue of well-being. It's in HMIC's inspection and we've got the, we're the biggest single sector ever to sign up to Public Health England's well-being charter. Uh, we've got a huge amount of work to do on that but it's been agreed um, by the College of Police and National Chiefs, Police Chiefs Council and it's in the HMRC inspection. That in itself, there is no sector that needs that more than us, so it's right that we're the biggest sector that signed up to it. Uh, and uh, we've got a lot of work to do, but we've got an evidence-based framework to, to work it from. I'm going to talk about personal responsibility uh, because a lot of this, uh, the learning that we're doing, what I'm finding is the third point is that there's a lot of blame there's a lot of judging and there's, and, and there's less taking responsibility for this issue, particularly among senior leaders in the organisation. And one of the big issues that I'm going to talk about and make um, uh, one of my priorities, and I think for the service in 2017, is PTSD. Uh, and I'm speaking to people um, like uh, Jill from the PDT, uh, Police Federation, and I'd like to speak with yourselves around this, around our understanding of PTSD. Um, how it affects how we do our job, not just the negative aspects of it, but how we can look at PTSD as something that actually is quite normal, uh, given what we expose a lot of our staff and ourselves to over uh, the uh, series of our service. So what have we learned so far? A lot of the things that I've put up on the questions are about what we've learned so far. Um, <clears throat> the first thing is that this problem has always been there. It is um, coming out uh, more visibly now because there are less back office jobs. There are less places where people who weren't well used to go to do, it, to do their work and see their police careers out particularly. Um, we are learning that some people think well-being is still pink and fluffy. And that's because for them, they don't understand the severity of what we're talking about within well-being. The term itself... It is a little bit pink and fluffy. I prefer to use the word resilience. I think PTSD will sharpen our awareness of what well-being is about and early intervention. But in terms of what we've learned over the last sort of couple of years, um, resilience uh, or people struggling with resilience has been managed away and not dealt with. Um, we've defaulted to process uh, rather than a conversation. And we have engaged in a lot of things that on the surface look like they're fixing the problem, but in reality aren't. And there, are a lot of, there is a lot of money spent in the service that could be spent differently around more targeted early intervention approaches to um, our resilience. And if, you, if your force or your organisation you work for has got an um, outsourced employee assistance programme I urge you to, to, and it might not be the most interesting thing you've got to read in the next couple of days, have a look at it and just see what the offer is. Have a look how it's instigated, how it's initiated and what's on the back end of it. Because some of these programmes need us to know how to um, activate them. 
they have trigger plans that say it's the line manager who has to initiate the intervention. Quite often it may be the line manager who is part of the problem that's going on in that workspace. It tells you that you need to understand the needs of the people that are working for you so that you can direct them to wherever that employee assistance program um, is procured to provide you the service. And it's not always going to hit the mark with you. I fear that some of those programs are a bit like the Carlsberg Complaint Department. There's a phone and nobody ever rings it because we don't understand what it is we need. Um, and um, um, I think there's some high quality intervention at the back end of those programs that we need to understand how to access. So how work is designed matters. A lot of people, um, I had the privilege of coming down to Litchfield to speak to some uh, PPU supers and chief supers recently on the back of your survey and most people were talking about how work's arranged, how, how, how volume demands changing, how work's changing, how responsibilities are changing and how risk is being all apportioned into one area of command. So work is vitally important. But my argument um, today is that how we're designed uh, matters even more. Because our resilience is fundamentally about us as people. Uh, and that is something that um, I want to get across today, and I want to get across as we move forward with the wellbeing agenda. And, um, that this is starting to land with the service, but it needs leaders across the service to get hold of it and do something with it in reality. If there's anybody here going for command course, I wouldn't ask you even confidentially to cough that you're going for that this year. They've just changed the um, they've just changed the um, all the competencies, uh, and I believe well-being has been inserted. And it's never too late to get that in. Well-being and innovation have been inserted into the competencies. Um, there are specific things happening. You will find people asking more questions now because HMIC are asking us what we're doing about wellbeing. I was interviewed for three hours by HMIC about wellbeing. Um, quite a few of the questions I'd constructed and I found them really hard to answer. So um, I think where we are with HMIC is they're building up their knowledge of what, 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 it, what good looks like. Uh, but by asking those questions, don't underestimate how much that will get the grey matter going. It's a big opportunity. Um, so this is one of the things that I wanted to lead on to in terms of personal responsibility. Uh, I've got four minutes left by the countdown thing here, so I'm on time, I think. Um, this really resonated with me. We judge ourselves by our intentions and others by our, their behaviour. How often do we in the workplace judge other people by what we see? How often do people judge us by what they see? Uh, superintendents um, are in a very interesting part of the organisation's command structure and the organisational development of an organisation. They, they have majority of people that work for us to lead and manage and they have other people managing them and leading them from above. They are the jam in the sandwich. You are the jam in the sandwich, aren't you? And I think we need to understand that um, by just thinking differently about what was really intended rather than how somebody behaved. It doesn't make the behaviour right, but actually we need to understand what the intention is of people. I get a lot of stick, I get a lot of criticism at work for things that we do that I didn't even know I'd agreed that we were going to do. We all do that, don't we? And so our, our people are judging us by what they see and getting over what our intentions are rather than you know, because we're not going to get this right all the time, is a really, really beneficial way, I think, of thinking about well-being. I put this on here because I did a session at the command course on this, and I used the diagram on the right is the imposter syndrome. And I said, you know, one of the things that you've got to realise here is that, um, you know, I, I every now and again will, will mentor or support a newly promoted ACC, for example, who's been a really happy chief super and looks like a really unhappy ACC. And I say, be careful what you ask for. You know, how much of this is about you and your readiness for the role that you're going to take up? How much do you know about yourself and the people you're going to be working with? Because it's really, really important for us all, isn't it, to work with people who share our values and exhibit those in the behaviours. And so many people chase the dream and end up working for people who they don't particularly get on with and don't share the values. This is a key issue to move from the 
uh, what, what you know about yourself and what you think other people know to a more balanced um, self, level of self-awareness. And, uh, and this, this is the key thing for me, I find, is the parent-child relationship with your organisation or your bosses. How many of us succumb to that? We're polite, you know, we moan after we've been to a meeting, but we don't have authentic conversations. How often do we challenge upwards? How often do we just take, take work on because we're too frightened to say to the boss that we don't want to do it? Um, it's clear from your response that uh, you're doing a really good job of that. So what's working well for command resilience? Um, the Police Service of Scotland did a really good piece of work. I know you've hooked into that through the command resilience group. Um, I think that piece of work for me was more about engagement. I think uh, we talk about engagement and well-being, and that group of leaders from Police Scotland, I don't know if there's anybody here today from Police Scotland, I thought that was a significant piece of work for them to re-engage with their chief officer team and with their membership. There was a lot of clunky clunk stuff in there around work, but there was also a lot of stuff in there about relationships and, and things that needed to be put back on track as they felt. Uh, and that was dealt with very positively. Creating leadership space. Um, I think getting people like yourselves out of the workplace, it's difficult. It's where you can talk and think openly and reflect is a positive thing to do. Uh, and we need to be doing more of that because it gives you an opportunity to think more deeply about uh, your own well-being and the resilience of the people who work around you. One of the big things, um, I think, that's coming out of the work and what we've working well for command resilience is to put people back in touch with the actual meaning and purpose of their work. If you look at the type of work that our staff are doing or that we're doing as an organisation now, it's very different than the type of work that we used to do. The demand, and I know you talked about this yesterday with the superintendent matrix and fast forward in 20, 30 years, which I thought was a really good insight into what we should be thinking about. How many of our staff actually feel that that type of work has an air of hopelessness about it, rather than a sense of meaning and purpose about it? That's a question I think we should be asking people who work in the front line, working in PPU offices, working in contact management, working in FMIT teams, working in command groups. It all looks like a tsunami of complex need that we do not be able to see our, we cannot see our way through to a final conclusion. It's not as simple sometimes as the stuff that we used to do. Now, hooking people into that and gaining meaning and purpose from the work is a real challenge, but it can be done around the vulnerability agenda. And I think the sort of conversation that says, the reality of our work is that in 20, 30 years, this is what it's gonna look like. It actually looks like that now, a lot of it and we are not keeping pace, and we've got a little bit of an identity crisis that the front line are experiencing this, yet we're saying we value a different type of outcome from our work. So the world is changing, and the meaning and purpose of police work needs to change with it. And I think that's a very positive thing that we can talk about uh, to our staff. So I think the, nobody's ever ready at a completely at a personal level. I'm gonna shut up in a minute, because I'm running over. Um, I put this uh, diagram up. I think it's a really good one to talk to people about. It's normal to be anxious. Yeah, nobody, human nature, wants, nobody wants to be in boredom. Think about when you first started to drive or, you know, you first joined the job. You were constantly in that top end of anxiety where the challenge was greater than your skills to deal with it. Human nature is that we constantly ebb and flow between anxiety and boredom. So to talk to staff around the fact that anxiety is normal, boredom's normal, uh, and you're constantly ebbing and flowing around that flow channel in the middle. Uh, this is quite good um, evidence base. So we are the culture. Um, stop looking for somebody else to blame because they're probably blaming us. Everybody's blaming me for this. So uh, it, it generally five live, when everybody puts a survey out, I get the blame for this. Uh, it should be full of meaning and purpose. Our self-awareness is everything. And spot the signs, and most importantly, it's good to talk. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks very much uh, indeed, Andy. Don't forget, lots of questions, I'm sure, for uh, Andy later on. I'll give you a little chat about that uh, later. But first of all, we're going to hear from uh, Stephen Mann. Stephen is uh, Chief Executive of Police Mutual and has got uh, a contribution to make to this. Where's Stephen gone? Oh, he's there. Come and join us. A warm welcome.
Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, one of the uh, charms of being a UK-wide organisation is that we get to see lots of stuff. And what I'm going to talk about is what we've seen uh, in wellbeing on the uh, police side uh, and share some of the responses that we've made to the things that we've seen. I'm also going to build on what Annie just talked about and share some personal experiences between the link between leadership and wellbeing, uh, primarily from my time in the private sector, where I've seen some really ugly stuff. Uh, Many years ago, when I was a fresh-faced lawyer in the city, uh, I was described as the fodder, uh, just to give you a picture of uh, something that was quite ugly. Uh, to my time when I was at Viva, when I was business services director, where I was responsible for most of the change and transformation initiatives, including cost and efficiency ones, where we built into the program wellbeing and culture, not just because it made the programs deliver more effectively, but because we got more sustained results. Now, those weren't always effective, but I will leave you with a few thoughts on some of the things that I learned from that process. So. Uh, I like uh, birthdays, and uh, last uh, month, and the next slide will click up, I hope. Uh, just one second, here we go, get it manually. Uh, last month, uh, Police Mutual celebrated its 150th birthday. Uh, it's 150 years since a bunch of senior officers met in Windsor uh, to create a mutual assurance organisation with the aim quite deliberately to enable officers to save literally pennies uh, to provide uh, benefits for widows and orphans. And so wellbeing has been uh, with us right at the beginning and it's now in our purpose. And just reflecting what Andy has said, we have a very clear purpose, which is that we exist to improve the lives of the police family. Uh, and that plays through everything uh, that we say. Of course, the organisation is now quite markedly different uh, to what it was 150 years ago. Even 20 years ago, we hadn't heard of things like data. Uh, data for us is really key, and we have lots of it. We have over 220,000 members. We have data on over half a million other people. And we use that data, of course, to develop uh, products and services for our members, but we also use that data to get a deep understanding of what's going on uh, in the service. Uh, and uh, I want to be able to share uh, with you uh, how we've used some of that data in the past. So um, in uh, around about 2010, 2011, we started mixing that data uh, with credit scoring data. Uh, for those who are members, it's all very safe, it's all very confidential, uh, but it did create uh, quite an interesting picture, and this is one I think we used at the Supers Conference way back in 2011. And what it did was create a really interesting picture. It showed that on average, and I use the word on average very carefully, that on average, uh, around about two-thirds of the service were reasonably financially resilient, uh, that they suffered what we call reasonable levels of financial stress, so able to meet bills on a day-to-day -day basis. However, and it's a big however, that about a third uh, typically were beginning to fall into a red category, which means that they are at various levels beginning to struggle to make ends meet on a day-by-day -day basis. One of the things that was really interesting coming out of that was a very strong correlation between attitudes to saving and education. And it's not really rocket science when you think about it. If you are sensible, as one of the categories we called, or somebody who hoards, that your level of financial stress is probably going to be better than somebody who avoids these sorts of issues. And what we did find is that we began to socialise this with forces. There's a whole series of different patterns emerging around different profiles, different age groups, different forces. Um, were all different uh, and actually quite interestingly in a number of areas. So rolling that forward uh, four to five years, what's the current position? Well, um, overall and on average, uh, that picture has not deteriorated by as much as you might have thought with four years of austerity. And the obvious reason behind that is that if you've got two thirds of people with positive behaviours towards saving and financial matters, they're taking action. Now, don't confuse that with people being happy, because they're not, but they are taking care of some of their resilience. That bottom third, though, has continued to deteriorate. And this isn't police mutual data. Uh, this is data that we've sourced elsewhere. Uh, the police service are the third biggest user of payday loans amongst professionals. Now, the professional groups are not high users of payday loans, but nevertheless, it's an interesting statistic to share with you. Whether this is through need or lack of education or lack of access to other products, this is one which is worth sharing. Uh, teachers uh, were the highest group. Uh, which is interesting. Uh, what it also confirmed was the pattern on that previous slide, which is a third of officers are not saving. Now, that can be 
good for a whole series of reasons, uh, but actually over a lifetime, it's not something uh, which is particularly healthy or good for the force's uh, resilience. And building on uh, what Andy said earlier about what people worry about, it is often what worries, uh, what the worries are that are building outside uh, work. Uh, so 65% are affected by financial worries. So this is recent data. Uh, and material sue. So what we have done is that we've tried to make our mutual status really count. We are generally not for profit. Um, we don't try and make any money. Uh, so in the last four years, we've reduced our charges uh, and the uh, costs uh, of our products so that our income is now £15 million lower on a like-for-like -like basis than it was in 2012. So that's real money going back into the service. Uh, what we've also done is that we've started moving into lending. Now, you might think that's a bit odd, having just preached the perils of debt earlier. But actually, what we found with that data is that the service as a whole is a better credit risk than it's getting uh, being priced for by banks and building societies, uh, because with those right behaviours, people tend to repay. So what we've been able to do is offer loans uh, at better rates uh, than you can get elsewhere. Where this is interesting from a well-being agenda, uh, of course, is that um, uh, we've been able to track the movement in credit scores and how that flows through to financial worries over time. So, so far this year, we'll have lent 30 million. Uh, what we've seen is that those we lend to uh, typically see quite a material increase in their uh, credit score after just six months being with us. And a large number of these are being used to help repay and consolidate payday loans. So if we can take some of that worry away, that's what we're trying to do. One of the things that really concerned me about Police Mutual uh, six or seven years ago was that we needed to be able to step up to some of the challenges the service was facing. And what we did is we use and continue to use some of our financial strength uh, to fund what we call the Police Mutual Foundation. Uh, we're typically spending around about seven or eight hundred thousand pounds a year. Uh, we're guided by experts uh, in well-being as to where that money is deployed and we're delighted that Gavin is part of the team that helps determine where this goes. Uh, and one of the things that we do look to do is to fund uh, areas of thought leadership um, and building on what uh, Andy said earlier about the topic of mental health, uh, I'm really pleased that this is now uh, becoming a, a more current and acceptable conversation to be have, uh, having in the service. We supported and funded a piece of work by Professor Griffiths from Nottingham University, really posing two questions. The first is, uh, am I more likely to suffer a mental health issue because I live in a job and work in a job which is dangerous? The answer is yes. Uh, and secondly, is, is there and are there evidence across for uh, and across the continent of best practice in terms of dealing with it. And the answer was a very patchy one to the second, that there was some pockets of best practice emerging, but across the services as a whole, there was no consistent uh, way uh, of best practice in terms of dealing with it. Uh, what we've also done is respond in cash uh, terms because I think the uh, uh, effect of small interventions can be uh, really, really material. Uh, what we've done is that we fund two well-being patient advisors at the police treatment centres. Often when officers go there to have their body fixed, uh, the mind uh, also needs addressing uh, and these are there to help counsel and support them on their road to recovery. Uh, we are funding uh, a series of mental health champions in Surrey Police and when that work is complete and the results come through will ensure that that's socialised. Uh, you can apply to Police Mutual and ask for some money uh, to uh, fund uh, mindfulness and mental health uh, awareness programmes. We support your resilience survey uh, and one of the things we've been funding uh, free to forces for the last three or four years is the wellbeing zone uh, which does enable you to get self-help and to track your own well-being. Uh, I'm delighted to say that's now available in 30 forces and we have over 40,000 and registered users. So well-being is at the heart of many of those things. And of course, this is easy to get swamped with statistics. These are real people. Um, and we're always open to nominations if you are aware of someone who needs a break to get away from it as part of their um, uh, recovery. Uh, last year, uh, we uh, have sent 173 families on respite breaks paid for by us. Uh, and what we do do is track whether that has a positive impact on their well-being. Uh, and yes, it does. Uh, and we'll be uh, funding breaks for about 200 families uh, this year as well.
So that's important for us to do. One of the things that's really evident about well-being uh, is that having pride in your job is at the core of it. Once you start feeling demotivated about the outcomes that you have, whether it's because you don't believe in the purpose or because you're not believing that there's any effect in it, uh, that is one of the things that needs to be addressed. So one of the things that we have done is funded uh, a lot of community activity. And this was based on our hunch, which we know to be true, of course, that when officers take their uniform off, they don't stop being public servants. So what we've funded over the last 12 months is over 1,300 community initiatives, uh, ranging from youth groups to uh, young offender groups and all those sorts of things. Uh, we've been able to support officers and get some local publicity for what they do to help restore some pride in what it is that people do. Uh, we've just launched uh, a further tranche of 50,000 available for local funding uh, earlier this week. So that's really important about restoring uh, pride. One of our most recent initiatives, and we're in conversation with a number of forces, is to uh, launch uh, free employee benefits, so flexible benefits by another frame. So what we do know is that flexible benefit platforms are great tools to enable uh, leaders and organisations to drive engagement and well-being. Um, we are providing it free to forces, um, and for us it's really important because uh, it's very easy for us and easier for us to speak to supers and officers, actually being able to reach out to staff is much harder uh, without being able to have access to internet and force uh, flexible benefit platforms. Uh, it is market leading technology, Please, Mitch will be running it, we'll be fronting it. Uh, we are partnering with Capita who will be providing the kit. Uh, they uh, uh, currently provide the system to Sky. There's a nice little quote there that says uh, this does great things for our engagement. Uh, so we'll be overseeing it but our big belief in this is that this will be a major tool uh, for senior leaders in the service to be able to improve the level of engagement that they have uh, right across uh, the piece. So um, what we've also done uh, is continue to uh, invest and support a wellbeing toolkit, which Andy's team have helped develop. Uh, one of the things about being a leader, uh, to copy Andy, is that you are constantly anxious. Um, and for me, this is a fantastic toolkit to have at your uh, side to have a lot of um, very well-developed, well-considered tools and techniques that uh, uh, you can never be good enough in understanding. We have copies uh, on our stand. We're developing a digital version. You can see a copy of that as well. Uh, I think this is a fantastic cool kit. Many people are put in roles without the skills to be able to do them effectively uh, and to be able to understand that well-being goes to the heart of creating uh, an effective uh, leadership uh, uh, team. So that's out there as well. Uh, so uh, in summary, uh, well-being is our purpose. We talk about improving lives at the heart of what we do and we have specific measures and it's really interesting to have a financial services business that is not measured by profit and loss. Uh, I'm measured, uh, my pay is measured by whether I can show that I've made lives easier, happier and longer. Now, in some of those cases I can show that, in others it's quite aspirational. Uh, but as part of that, we are now giving back to the service more than we've done at any time in our history and we want to be able to build on that. I don't think it's a link that last year we had a record year. Uh, that record year was also a record year we gave uh, back to the service, and I think the two uh, are clearly uh, linked. But in terms of leadership, um, you know, they need to be authentic. You can't kid the kidders. Uh, you actually have to mean it. It's not a tick box exercise, and it has to be uh, led from the top. Everybody understands that. I would much rather have a poor strategy well led than a great strategy that's poorly led. And I think when we talk about authenticity, we need to be clear on what that means. It is really meaningful. It's not about just being authentic. Um, I had a colleague uh, who used to say she was authentic because what you saw is what you got. And actually most people really disliked what they saw. <laughs> and uh, there's a lovely book about uh, uh, the question of authentic leadership and it talks about being yourself more, which is authentic, but be yourself more with skill. And that's that with skill bit, which is the really hard bit. And that is very contextual as well. There's also a bit about just creating uh, the right environment for well-being to flourish. Uh, um, when I get consultants coming to me to talk about the 100-day culture change program, I kick them straight out uh, because it's not a tick box exercise. Culture is a sweaty two to three year piece of work. It's gritty. Uh, you never get the chance to declare victory. Um, 
Uh, but what you have to do is actually create the environment, and that's about choosing the team that can lead it. It's about choosing the things that you're going to fight on. It's about uh, not just doing things for symbolism's sake, but choosing the things that are symbolic and substantial uh, that will be necessary about taking the right decisions. And that can be about removing people from your teams. It can be about pushing them to a situation where they stop causing damage. Um, and actually, fundamentally, one of the big things I find and I've seen with culture is that the senior team decide the sort of culture that they like and that they want. And actually, it's completely disconnected with what the ground to, what's really needed on the ground. So do your research and find out what really works. Uh, I can remember kicking off a major culture program, and actually what people really needed was a kettle that worked somewhere to park, uh, someone to be able to hang up their cycle kit when they got to work. Uh, and we were just talking at loggerheads and those sorts of things. So it's not a tick box exercise. And I said, be wary of declaring uh, victory early. And well-being is something that you do as leaders uh, every day. Uh, and it's not something that you can flit in and flit out from. And that's a real challenge I have. I have a very busy technical role, uh, but I also have a, a role of leading uh, nearly 700 people uh, as well. Uh, much more challenging at Aviva, where I had nearly 6,000 people. You constantly have to be on it. Uh, somebody told me that you're only as good a leader as the last time you let yourself down as a leader. Uh, and that's so true. People look for gaps. They look for weaknesses. You're constantly on show. Uh, but I think if you make an integral part of how uh, you speak to people, how you engage, uh, and how you act, uh, then you give yourself the best chance uh, of success. Uh, so I think we're just about out. I think, Andy, are we now on the uh, platform? I think, John, are we now well, going to facilitate thank some you questions? Very much. A warm response for Stephen. Thank you. OK, uh, time for your uh, questions and observations. Uh, what I'd like to do, if, if, if at all possible, uh, during the, the minutes remaining, is actually turn some of those statistics that came up as a result of uh, Andy's questions into anecdotes and personal experiences. I mean, if, for example, there's anyone in this room who's happy to talk about the fact that they had to have medication as a consequence of, uh, of the job, I'd like to hear from you. I'd like to hear what the impact of all this has had on you, uh, on your family. I'd like to hear from you about the response of your bosses to any concerns uh, you've expressed. <coughs> and I'd like to also hear from you uh, if you have any thoughts on what more people like Andy and uh, more senior figures in, in the force can do as well. So hands up any questions, please. You, as usual, we've got microphones uh, strategically placed uh, all over the room. So if anyone's got any questions or observations, start with this gentleman here. As ever, please tell us who you are. And, uh, and if you don't mind standing up, it's helpful for the cameras. Uh, <coughs> thank you. Thanks, Excuse me, my voice is going. Uh, I haven't even started yet. Uh, off you go. I thought I was tall enough sitting down. Um, uh, Alan Thomas from Gwent Police. Um, we, I know that the, the emphasis on this is very much around personal resilience and the, the uh, things that we can do, but Stephen's talked there about the importance of culture as well. I'm just wondering, in terms of the current stock of MPCC, and it's a you know, continu continuing flow and, cha and change, what is the sort of mood, music, and sympathy or empathy towards personal resilience, um, whether it's from the federated ranks or from the association? Um, I think the in, the in the network that I operate in, I, can, I could say that I would, in a good half of forces, the chief officer specifically is well engaged with this. Um, I think that's a real positive. I think I'm not criticising the other half that aren't, I think what happens is that this agenda is often seen as belonging to HR, L&D or occupational health. So some of the big events that we've done, uh, understandably, when there's a lot of things coming into a force, this gets delegated to somebody who seems to be the person who should be leading it. And uh, the, the, the change we've got to make um, to get this onto the agenda and for people to care about it is to move away from just looking at what the data says. Because the data around sickness absence doesn't tell you the whole story. There's loads of things inaccurate about the data. There's lots of gaps in it and how we collect it's wrong. It's, it's very disparate. So uh, I think to answer your question, I think that I think more and more people are switching on to this. Um, I did a presentation to this year's command course that's come, that, came, that came out this year. And I personally felt there was a very different group of people in there. And what I said to them was that um, superintendents will say to me, ask them not to change. 
I think their resilience is as important as, as everybody else's, uh, quite honestly. And I think if those people who are different come through into those very challenging ranks, then it's my job and my colleagues' job to support them just as much so that it flows through the organisation. But I, I think very slowly, as Stephen says, it's contact sport, it's gritty, it's cultural. Um, I think we're slowly moving in the right direction. Uh, I'm not sure everyone, Andy, um, agrees with you that it's as optimistic as you, put it, yeah. put it that way, because I've got one question here uh, via the app. It's good to hear that uh, SPNAC competences have been changed to include a focus on well-being. What's being done to influence chief officer behaviours amongst those already in post, some of whom do not demonstrate a commitment to such values? I mean, in other words, I think they're... So what, what are you actively doing to get that other half on board, as it were? Well, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a pragmatic optimist because I, I, will, I will say that I think the, um, it shouldn't have to be driven by things like Peel assessment, but believe you me, people take notice of the inspectorate. Um, maybe it's sometimes they take notice for the wrong reasons, sometimes they take notice for the right reasons, but the questions that are being asked now are very difficult to answer if you are not doing your job according to the values with which the service says it wants you to do it. It is very difficult because they are talking about the key to this is staff engagement. In, in my organisation, the only way that we have accelerated a degree of behavioural integrity is by using staff engagement in a very innovative way because the organisation's command structure prevents feedback going up and around different management levels. Uh, and that is something that we're talking a lot about. It's fed in through the inspectorate. There's a lot of work going around the survey. I think there's 22 forces in the country now doing the Durham survey. That survey, it's not just about doing it, it's what you do with it when it comes out and how you interpret, analyze, and take action around it. So if you're in a force that's surveying staff um, is going through Peel, these are the questions that are being asked now. And over time, I am convinced that things will start to change far for the, for the better. Are you, Stephen, are you as, I mean, you know, I know you look at it from a different yeah. perspective, but are you as cautiously optimistic as Andy about this? Um, I think for culture to work, it needs to be valued by the senior team. And if it's not valued, it doesn't stick. Uh, and that's regardless of whether it's in the private sector uh, or the public sector. And I'm personally quite ambivalent about whether leaders get it because it's uh, a really great thing to do. Uh, certainly that's at the heart of uh, why I do what I do. Uh, but many people are increasingly get it because it's the right thing to do and it makes good sense. There's bag loads of evidence that shows the link between highly engaged workforces uh, and great outcomes. Uh, and I don't need to, to, to say that or share that level of detail. Uh, I think um, part of the worry I would have is that uh, the nature of leading people in the 21st century is very different. Um, you know, to build on some points Andy said earlier, 25 years ago, I didn't think I could be a leader because the people I saw were barrel-chested tank commanders who would bark orders at you, and that's not me. But if I look at my team now, they don't want that. They have uh, and work in close communities of 10 to 15, uh, and they're looking to be led in a very values-based way where they have a clear sense of purpose, and I think that is a real challenge for senior teams to try and make sense of that agenda and really value it. And I think the evidence is patchy, John. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, gentlemen over there, stand up if you don't mind, tell us who you are and put your question or make your comment. My, my name is uh, Michael Mulqueen from Leicestershire. To what degree does a culture in which we tend to self-diagnose success in terms of our attainment of rank and self-diagnose failure as our failure to attain rank at odds with the instigation of a culture of well-being. And how do we manage that contradiction or that paradox or that tension such that we can parallel well-being with the benefits of a command and control organisation? Could I ask you what, what's behind your question? Is there some experience behind your question? I'm new in service. I'm, uh, I'm one of those direct entry uh, candidates. Um, so I wouldn't claim to have the sort of organisational uh, history or institutional knowledge that colleagues have here. But I have already seen, to some dismay really, um, promotional campaigns where people, you've, you've had to p pick people up off the ground because they've not achieved the rank that they've wanted 
or their entire and sole focus has been mm. on the attainment of success at the interview board, it breeds such a level of competitiveness that I question the degree to which we can engage in authentic or sympathetic or empathic management if one sees the world in, in that kind of rival terms. Very interesting. So, Andy? Um, the, when we did our original work around well-being uh, and resilience and what matters with staff on the, on the uh, engagement work, uh, this came up. In most organisations, I think it's on CIPD stats, the most important thing for uh, whether you're attracted to work somewhere is fairness. People want to work somewhere where they think it's fair. And we know all the procedural justice evidence is very strong on this. Promotion processes, if they are not fair, um, create a huge problem in the organisation. And the expectations people have had around promotion um, have been thwarted, sometimes for reasons outside of the control of the organisation. We've got less managers, less leaders. We, we haven't done a promotion board for sergeants for four years. I had 400 people with the sergeants exam. It creates a, a really unhealthy um, conflict between people who are, who are going for 40 jobs, 400 people, 40 jobs. The first priority is to make sure that the process they're going to go into, therefore, is fair. So even if they don't get through it, they know it's a fair process. The second thing is that the process itself gets you the type of leader that, as Stephen said, is not the leader we used to have, it's the one that's fit for purpose moving forward. So um, promotion processes, um, I think the culture around upward progression in the organisation um, feeds the beast. Uh, and, and it creates a huge amount of um, internal conflict that, for me, I have been taken aback by how much um, how much strength of feeling there is out there about people who can't get promoted even though they know mathematically it's impossible. Do you want to come back on that, Michael? Um, I think the... For me, I think that recognition that it feeds the beast is hugely important. It's very welcome and it's very refreshing. I think there is something also to be done, and I, I, again, I would commend the College of Policing around this, Around somehow or other, we as leaders having genuine conversations, authentic conversations with our people about the importance of the role that they currently inhabit. Um, I, one of the ways I suppose I've been trying to counsel folks is, you know, in the role, and it is a utopian argument, but you're in the role that you're doing to do some good. If you find that in order to achieve your outcome, you just so it just so happens that you have to go for the next rank, then that's a solid base on which to proceed. Please do not, please do not, I suppose, uh, allow the situation to arise where your sole and overriding motivation is the attainment of promotion. And I found it quite personally surprising that I've had to have those conversations, because in some ways it sounds like philosophy 101. You know, we're not here on this earth simply to get promoted. <laughs> but it has been an important conversation for people. I feel it has been a moment of release for some people. But in my reflective moments, I've had to ask myself, what is it about our culture and our organisation where such conversations are necessary? And my only conclusion is that it's that historical legacy, command and control, promotionally driven, and success mm. and personal success being defined by how much of this stuff yep. you're running on your I think, shoulders. I think you've, you've sort of gone some way to addressing that. Anybody, anything well, you'd like to add? Well, I, th I think one of the things that happens when you do staff engagement work is it breaks out you out of Pollyanna thinking. Um, I get involved in a lot of interviews and I ask the question, you know, why, why are you going for promotion? And I get answers like, it's more money. I get answers like, well, you know, I joined with somebody else and they've got promoted, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm one want to get promoted. It's not everybody's joined the police service, walking through the door, thinking explicitly that they want to make a difference. That might be something, the job, career and calling that comes to them later in the service when they've experienced the difference they can make. So I think first and foremost, not everybody who joins the police service comes in with that explicit awareness that they're here to make a difference. Uh, th that, 
that has not been the way we have generally recruited people. Some people want to jump through windows, point guns at people and have a jolly good time. That's what I did for 10 years. I have only found my calling in policing later on as I've grown up as a human being. So I think before we start criticising this upward procession, you know, we need to understand the fact that not everybody is aware of why they're here. Okay. If you uh, see what I mean. Lady here, stand up if you don't mind, tell us who you are. Morning, Penny Bannon from the Met. Um, just a bit of positive feedback, really, for Police Mutual. Um, our staff, if we look at the results of our recent staff survey, uh, members have been severely impacted by financial cuts and paying conditions and the recent austerity measures. And along with the cuts to the back office functions that you've mentioned, such as HR. But Police Mutual, um, I've used them recently. You've come in to my borough. You've conducted the health checks, the breakfast. You've given advice on finance. Um, and all sorts of all sorts of other stuff, and it's had really positive feedback. Um, I've used your respite care. I put somebody um, nominated an officer who suffered a mental breakdown following quite a traumatic homicide, and uh, you've supported them through respite. So thank you very much. So staff weren't aware of some of the measures that are out there and some of the support, and um, they are now. So thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank Did you plant her? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Well done. Anybody else want Thank to come you. in from the floor, by the way? Uh, uh, one question... Is that a hand up? No, one. One question from me, Andy, I suppose I think I ask you this every single time, really, but it's, it's worth, worth, worth reiterating. You know, while one fully appreciates that a 27% cut in, your, in the numbers of superintendents is very difficult to contend with, uh, and given all the other factors and problems that police officers, men and women, face, fine, one acknowledges that, but is it significantly any worse than the sort of plight of, for example, currently in the headline, in the headlines, junior doctors, uh, equivalent people in the fire service, equivalent people in the ambulance service. I know it doesn't make it better, but is it any worse? Um, I think there's something about, per personally, and I could be accused of saying this because I'm a police officer, that uh, the police service operates in the system at the crisis end. So if everything doesn't go according to plan, we are the people who pick up the pieces because we're a blue light service. That's not to say that junior doctors and, and other people are engaged in that type of work. But we, in terms of managing the risk that's happening across the system that is starting to emerge now visibly, but it's a slow burn risk, is, is being held by a lot of people in less jobs. Mm. And the key thing that we've got to do is, for example, make the vulnerability agenda everybody's responsibility, not just the super in PPU, because they will not cope that system will not cope, and the investment in PPU. I was asked by HMIC, you've invested only 5.5% extra in PPU, and the national average is 8%. And I said, well, that's, that's still 192% less than we need to put in then, according to predicted demand that's coming through the door over the next five years into PPU. It will not cope. So the whole organisation and the whole system's got to start. To, to adapt. So even when, so even when the police minister, sorry, even when the police minister this afternoon uh, says to me and says to uh, this assembly of people, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, it's tough, but that's how it's going to be. That ain't going to change. In fact, arguably, it could well, get worse, and maybe even more cuts. Well, what, cuts. What are you going to say to him? Well, one of the things I'd like to say is to the people who hold us to account, is uh, understand the nature of what we do, because there will be people in this room and people like myself who are under investigation because our police officer at three o'clock in the morning made the decision not to kick that front door in and found somebody who we should have found earlier, who's already been case managed by mental health services, local authority, um, uh, you know, acute uh, health trusts, other, other organisations who, who have not done their job or have, for one reason or another, maybe not their fault, not done their job for that vulnerable individual. But there is one organisation that's picking up all the accountability for it, that's my view. And that is having a detrimental effect on people who want to work in certain parts of our organisation or even join our organisation. Oh. So we're out of balance slightly with where the accountability for supporting vulnerable people, in my view. Um, and what's your itself. response to those people I've been talking to who say, yeah, we're making all these cuts, we're making all these changes. For example, you know, police forces are in effect merging in the sense that officers 
some officers at, 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 at below the level yeah. of superintendent, um, including superintendents, look after two or three areas, two or three different uh, constabularies, whereas the chief officers have all remained in place. You know, the, the mm. argument being, get rid of some of the chief officers, don't expect the lads and lasses on the shop floor to stretch themselves as thin as they're having to do right now. The, well, one of the reasons there's so many chief officers in is because we've got police and crime commissioners, isn't it? You've got what? We've got police and crime commissioners. So where, where, where chief officers have said that there's two forces and we'll have one chief constable, legislatively you can't actually do it. Um, I, I do think that there is a responsibility on chief officer teams to look at where the hit gets taken uh, and to make sure it's balanced. Um, but also there are restrictions within how many police forces we've got that negate how many chief officers you have to have. You have got to have 43 police forces. Legislatively, you need 43 chief constables. So I think, I think there's lots of imperfect things in the system, Gordon, what I'm saying. In, in terms of where we are now, we are under huge pressure around particularly the vulnerability agenda and the type of need that's coming in. And if we're not careful, the behaviours that we adopt that are risk averse are going to make a bad situation worse. Do you want the last word, Stephen? I mean, the public are the police, and uh, I think uh, all the other pressures we've talked about uh, you're seeing come through. I think the only thing I would add is that uh, as a uh, person who led quite material cost-cutting programmes at Aviva, uh, you wouldn't start with the current police service structure if you had a blank sheet of paper. But they ain't going to change it. No. Anybody else want to come in? If not, uh, I'll say thank you very much indeed. I'm sure you'd like to show your appreciation both Andy and Stephen.